Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to Irish Influence. Um, usual things up today. I have to thank the um, Irish Consulate in Boston for all their support, Irish studies over in Boston, and of course, Boston College Ireland. Our fantastic guest this evening is Katrina Crow, who's former head of special projects at the National Archives of Ireland, uh, where she was a manager of the the Census Online project, which placed the Irish 1901 and 1911 Census Online, which were free to access. Um, she's the editor of Dublin 1911, published by the Royal Irish Academy, and she presented the RT documentaries Ireland Before the Rising in 2016 and Life After the Rising, shown in 2019. She's an honorary president of the Irish Labour History Society and former president of the Women's History Association of Ireland, and also a member of the Royal Irish Academy. So, Katrina, Welcome. And before I hand over to Joe, I'll remind everybody who's here, if you want to ask Katrina questions as we go along, don't just wait till the last two minutes, because that doesn't work, because we can't get to them all. Um, type them into the box, and we'll read them out. Joe. Hey, thanks very much, Mike, and thanks everybody for being here, and thanks so much for Katrina. Really lovely to have you here. Mike gave only a small portion of the list of your attributes and your, your achievements and all of the things that you're part of. So most of us out here who've been paying any attention to the world of Ireland over the last few years, know quite a bit about you already, but I don't know anything about, about your early years, Katrina. You are, by the sound of you, a Dublin woman. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about growing up, perhaps? How about that? Well, I was born in Dublin, Joe, and first of all, thank you for having me. It's, it's a great delight to be here tonight. Um, it's tonight here. What time is it over there? Mid-afternoon, 4.30. Mid-afternoon, okay. Well, for me, it's dark outside in Dublin. It's not raining, which is always good news. So I was born in Dublin. My father came from Clare. My mother came from Monaghan, which meant they were a mixture of north and south. Um, I suppose I became very attached to my father's home place in Clare, which was on the banks of the Shannon, where I used to go for my summer holidays, which is what happened to kids in Dublin back in those years. Nobody went on continental holidays. Joe Walsh tours, which has just been abolished by the recession, uh, hadn't existed then. So the idea of going to Spain was completely fantastic. You weren't going to do that. You went on your holidays to your aunt and uncle in the bog and they made you do things because nobody could be sitting around doing nothing. My Aunt Mary did say to me, if you think you're going to be here now reading books the whole time, you have another thing coming to you. So I can milk a cow and I know about saving hay. And I had a wonderful time. I was privileged to observe basically medieval life as it was lived for 400 years in Europe, and it still lived in many parts of the world. Uh, no running water, a well originally, which I used to get a bucket and go and get water from in the morning time, beautiful, fresh, clean water. So I know the exact well is a good thing to know because a lot of people in the world today are still having to carry buckets of water to, to their uh, homesteads. Um, no sanitation, as my Mary was great fun, we used to say, there's acres and acres of toilet, if you want it. Um, and cooking over an open fire. So, as you know, an old thatch cottage um, with a huge big kitchen and some rooms off it and a, an orchard and kitchen at the back. So I guess I was really privileged to, to experience that. And then to come back to Dublin to a modern semi-detached house where there was running water and sanitation and an electric cooker and all of those things. It, it made me very aware of how far things have come in quite a short time in Ireland uh, uh, since, uh, since I was born. So went to school with the Dominican nuns, um, was very rebellious as a schoolgirl, read the Communist Manifesto when I was 16, which uh, turned me into a complete rebel. Um, left school, went to college, studied history and English in UCD, where I had people like Dennis Donoghue and Seamus Dean uh, teaching me literature, and the marvellous Dudley Edwards, who was a person out of a movie with a shock of white hair and a very insulting way with everybody. If you, if you bullied him back, he respected you, but otherwise, and you. Walk all over you. And great people like Fergus Darcy, who was a great labour historian. Oh. And, you know, getting to, to know him and, and meet him was great. And then when I, I, I sort of dithered about maybe doing an MA when I left. I was always torn between history and literature. And I decided, no, I was going to get a job. So I got a job reluctantly, because it would have been much nicer from my point of view at that stage to live on the dole and drink and enjoy myself and go to gigs. There was a lot of great music in Dublin back in the early 70s. 
Um, so I got a job in the, the public library service for a while, and then a job came up in what was then the public record office in Walcourt. And, you know, people often say, how did you end up in archives? Was that always your dream? Was that what you wanted to do? No. Tony Cronin, the late, great Tony Cronin, always said that most people's lives were more influenced by drift than any of us would like to imagine. And the same is true of me. I hadn't, there was no archives diploma course then. You couldn't study to be an archivist. You needed was a history degree. So I applied for that job, having been turned down as a third secretary in the Department of Foreign Affairs, which would have been, I'm sure the Consul General is delighted I'm not there to haunt their lives and didn't end up there. Um, because they unfortunately asked me during the interview that if, if I was asked to raise a million pounds for the government, how would I do it? And I said, if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't be sitting here trying to get a job. <laughs> they said, don't call us, we we'll call you. So I landed up in the public record office, knowing nothing about it, having to learn on the job. There wasn't an archives course in UCD until much later in the 1970s. So we had to learn as we went along. And of course, it was haunted by the specter of the destruction of the four courts in 1922, which actually still haunts me to this day. It was one of the huge disasters uh, in terms of Irish historiography. But it was a fascinating place to be. And as somebody who's interested in history, it's not uh, difficult to become interested in the raw materials, the primary sources, all of that stuff. So that was my growing up and to my job. And when did that happen? You said you kind of, it, it wasn't some, you weren't sitting there as a 12 year old thinking, I want to be an archivist, I must be an archivist. It's something you kind of drift into, fall into, but clearly it then becomes something that dominates your life that you have a passion for, you've led from the front for. When did it all sort of take shape and click in that this really mattered? And you were going to be its, I suppose, not saviour, but you're going to be its advocate in society. Well, I'm one of the advocates, Mike. You know, people overstate my, my power and, and uh, good works in this respect. It, it is a privilege to, to have been able to do some useful things in, in the world of archives. I'm not sure. I mean, in the early 70s, I was uh, mid to late 70s, I moved into the city from the suburbs. And I was living in Mountjoy Square and hanging out with people like Tony Gregory and the, the local community development people. I was very interested in local left-wing politics. So I was focusing far more on that than I was on work in the archives. But it coincided with my being exiled from the four courts to the smaller office, the state paper office, which was the old tower in Dublin Castle, in which was contained the records of the chief secretary's office, probably the best 19th century archive relating to Ireland anywhere in the world beginning with the 1798 rebellion and going right up to 1922 and covering every aspect of the administration of the country. And that was extraordinary. I mean, there was a teeny tiny reading, reading room with a big table. Joe, you might remember it perhaps, but most people don't know. It's been gone for a long time. I remember it. You remember it, Mike, fair yep. you. And you had to sit around this big table and people kept falling in love over the table because they were so close to each other. It'd be totally against any COVID regulations now. But I do remember, it was always interesting to, to talk to the readers. I suppose a connection with the public is really important if you're trying to run a reader. And you re I, I mean, one thing that I always felt very strongly is the people who come in to use the services are paying our wages. That's who we're responsible to. And you try to treat them you can and give them, if you can, what they want. And one of my most interesting readers in the state paper office, this would have been in the late 70s was Robert Fisk, who alas left yeah. us uh, last year. And at that time, he was the Irish Times correspondent in, in the Lebanon, in Beirut. And he was going and coming, and uh, he, he was writing his book about Northern Ireland, which is a very good book, uh, and wanted access to the records of the Department of the Taoiseach, which was the first big release that we had of modern departmental records. So I did something you're not meant to do at all. The, I would be killed these days for doing it. I let him into the stacks because I trusted him because right. the records weren't cataloged. And he was able to, I mean, I supervised him. I looked in on him to make sure he wasn't tearing pages out or destroying anything, but I knew he wouldn't do that. Uh, but what was fascinating about him was, you know, he came in one day and said, he was just back from a trip to, to the Lebanon. And he said, you know, um, three weeks ago, I was, I was in this village outside Beirut, and it was a thriving village, and there were about 
300 people living there and they had everything you imagined would be in the village. And when I went back, it was gone. Like it's just gone from the face of the earth. Um, it's not an archival story, but it's, it is still about the vanishing of something uh, important, um, intricate, informative and human. That, that it really struck me and I thought it was fascinating that he saw things in that way. So that was interesting. Then I went back to the Four Courts and uh, the chairperson of the union branch and being bolshy to my boss about various things. I, I always wanted flexi time because I can't get up in the morning and it's just the way I am. So the idea of having to be in at nine o'clock in the morning simply couldn't be done. My biorhythms, as I told my boss, were out of sync with that kind of life. He could give us flexi time and solve my problem. I wouldn't have to come in until 10. Eventually I got it. In the meantime, I was late all the time, crucified all the time for being late. But the way they ran those days, the Department of Justice was our determining department. And their way of punishing you for being late was to stop your increment, which is the bit of money you get every year to bring your salary up to a certain point. Uh, and then they'd give it all back to you in a lump sum at the end of the year. Which really, you know, I could never save money. As far as I was concerned, this is money for my holidays. It was great. They had done me a favor. It just made no I actually thanked them on one occasion and said, this is really cool. I mean, I could never have saved this money. If I got it, I would have spent it. So thank you for that. Great. Right. My exile finished. I go before courts. And I suppose from then on, the big issue was legislation. Trying to get a new National Archives Act, which we did in 1986 which for the first time gave us the right to penalize anybody who destroyed government records and to have them released to the public 30 years after their creation, which led to a huge flowering of, as you will know, both of you, in, in modern 20th century Irish history, because this mass of 20th century records suddenly appeared and were made available to the public. And that was all very exciting um, and sort of changed a lot about the way we saw what we were doing. We didn't have to plead and beg and coax anymore to get people not to burn things in the backyard. We could actually threaten them with a jail sentence and a hefty, and I have to say, I really enjoy doing that to certain civil servants. Didn't see any value in this stuff at all. That dirty old stuff, they would say, yeah, I pity me who has to go through it and get my hands dirty. All you have to do is not burn it, if you don't mind. Anyway, we got there, and it was more or less a pretty great success, the National Archives Act. Most government departments were compliant, didn't hold back too much stuff. Um, and, you know, when they did, they had reasonably good reasons to do so. so. The thing is, Katrina, sorry, Joe, it's, just, oh, it's a follow-on question because the, the key thing there was that was a game-changer for people like me, historians. Um, the Archives Act, the move to Bishop Street, just made history available in a way it hadn't been before. And I think that this is a very personal idea, but I mean, I think in terms of what you've done, it's not simply you've been an advocate for archives. You've been a champion of history and its value in society. But this is actually important, that the past matters and it has a value. And where, where did that come from, this kind of translation of not just what you were doing and getting archives out there? Why, why does history matter in a contemporary society? Well, it's the old Santayana quote that is now a cliche, which is those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. Ireland has a very fractured and complicated history, part of which we're now investigating, interrogating. I don't like the word commemoration. I think it's probably the wrong word for this decade of centenaries that we're going through. But we had a very violent beginning. Um, we need to look at that. We, I'm very glad that one of, one of the things I'm proudest of is that we got things like the Bureau of Military History and Military Service Pensions files out into the public domain before everything's kicked off. So the books could be written before we got to, to 2016, which is the big goal, 2016 being the foundation myth of the state. This is going to be the biggest moment in the whole commemoration cycle, which indeed it was. Um, so it, th there was still serious residual fear on the part of civil servants about releasing material that was almost 100 years old relating to the War of Independence and the Civil War. And it took a lot of convincing over a long period to get them to do it. And one of the great heroes there was Peter Young, who was the uh, director of the military archives and a great friend of mine. And we pushed the Bureau stuff for years and years and years 
uh, saying, look, come on, it's nearly 100 years old. Nobody cares anymore. It's really important material. It was as if the records were kept in a strong room in government buildings, and there were two keys to it. One for the Department of the Fisher and the other for the Department of Defence. And both parties had to be present to open the door. And it was as if behind that door was radioactive, toxic stuff in these beautiful little deed boxes. It was impeccably kept, beautifully organized by the archivist who looked after it originally. And finally, we got it out. And, um, and I'll never forget the date they, they told us. Uh, it would have been around September 1999. And they uh, invited Peter and I into the Department of the Theatre and said, OK, we're giving you what you want. You're getting the Bureau stuff. It's going to be released when you're ready to take it. So we were delighted. And it was 12 o'clock in the day. We went and had a whiskey each in the Stevens Green Hotel to celebrate something we didn't think we'd ever see because there was so much resistance to it. And Peter left to go back to the military archives. I left to go back to the National Archives. And he, just, he blew me a kiss from the corner, waved at me. And that was the last time I saw him. He died a week later from a sudden heart attack at the age of 49. So that was heartbreaking because this was his moment. You know, this was the big goal, always to get this stuff out there. But we did get it out. And further, we got money to digitize it. Uh, I persuaded one of the very good civil servants in my own department to come up with a few bob to digitize the material. And as you both know, it's taken off. Everybody's looking at it. And it didn't cause the sky to fall on our heads. Mm. There was all kinds of new and interesting information in it, but principally information from people who weren't famous, who weren't uh, the leaders of the 1916 Rising or the uh, War of Independence. It was meant to stop at the end of the War of Independence, but didn't. In some cases, people went into the Civil War and got lots more information than you thought you would. So that was good. And then it was the, the, the argument was about the military service pensions files. And again, there was another onslaught by me and a couple of historians, Dermot Farger, you know, Halpin particularly. Uh, every chance we got, we would attack politicians and say, you've got to release this material. It's too important. Um, and they did. And uh, that was another great moment, a huge collection of material. We probably have the best documented Revolution. I put revolution in inverted commas. I'm not sure it is. I, certainly from my perspective, no. If it was a revolution, it was a highly conservative one. Um, but it was really necessary to get all this stuff out, not just to tell us what happened in terms of military engagements and who won what battles and where ambushes took place. But in, in terms of the military service pensions files, we sort of have a shadow history of poverty in Ireland because of the, the stuff you're getting about ill health and people being in very poor circumstances, desperately needing these pensions that were paltry enough, but they would have made a difference to a lot of people. So that's all there for everyone's eternal enchantment for as long as they want to look at it. So it has changed the way research has been carried on on the period and made a difference to the way that we're seeing this decade of centenaries now. So that, that, was, that was important. The import, you were asking me about the, the importance of history. Again, this fractured country, the fact that, you know, I realized one day when I was, I used to do a lot of education stuff when I was in the archives and I was giving a lecture to a class of journalism students in uh, DIT who were next door to us. And I realized none of them had ever heard of Nelson's Pillar. None of them were alive when it was blown up. None of them had seen any pictures of it. None of them were interested in it. And it, it brought me up short. I just thought, wow. How, how, you know, I'm alive. I was alive in 1966. I remember vividly when the thing went up. It was a scream because they, you know, the, the guys who blew it up did it very carefully and just had this half stump and didn't break any windows. The army come in and finished the job and break every window in O'Connor Street. So it was, and Ronnie Drew wrote a very rude song about the whole thing, which <laughs> cheered everyone up and got banned on the radio. But, you know, they didn't know about this. It hadn't been passed on to them in their families. And the whole business of how the past gets mediated to people, a lot of it happens in families. But if people in family are not interested in history, they're not going to be told. Like they might learn family history, which is why things like the census become important, because they relate and touch people directly in terms of their own family history. Um, but I'm, I'm also intensely interested in the history of violence in Ireland, hmm. because it's still an issue. It's still something we're having to look at and contemplate and think about. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a narrative that, you know, armed struggle is the only way to get what you want. And the, the fact that Sinn Féin still cling 
absolutely fervently to the armed struggle and the IRA, to me is dismaying. I didn't think that would happen. I thought that people would realize that, that this kind of thing, 30 years of that kind of attrition and misery and loss. And one of the things we're starting to understand now about the, um, the original troubles is precisely how much bereavement and loss and trauma came from. And I suppose one of the things that I would like to see people doing during this decade of centenaries is thinking about that a bit more. Thinking about the fact that, that 40,000 Irishmen were killed in World War I, every one of them had, had a family who mourned them and uh, grieved for them. And 6,000 odd people from the 1916 Rising War of Independence and the uh, Civil War. These are all individuals who were gone and, um, and some of them in atrocious circumstances. And the same is true, you know, books like Bear in Mind These Dead by Susan McKay are huge contributions to our understanding of loss and trauma and some sort of way of moving on. It's a term I don't like, but people have to have some way of trying to recover from this to live their lives. So I think we need to do a lot more thinking about that and stop heroizing violence as uh, an obvious choice when there are always others. I'm always fascinated by the fact that um, the two big movies for our, our War of Independence and Civil War are Michael Collins by Neil Jordan and The Wind That Shakes the Barley, Ken Loach, both very good movies, but both focused on military struggle. What does uh, Jordan leave out of Michael Collins? The treaty negotiations, for God's sake which are one of the most fascinating, and we're going to come up to that now, and hopefully there'll be really good dramatic reconstructions of the treaty debates at the end of this year. But, you know, when Steven Spielberg decided to make his Civil War movie, he didn't make it about the battlefield. He made it about the battle for the 13th Amendment in Congress, which is actually one of the most exciting moments in legislative history. And it is breathtakingly interesting. It was a huge success. Nobody was killed in it, except his son went to war. But, you know, it was, this was not about bombs and bullets and tragic heroism. It was about getting your hands dirty to persuade your opponents to pass a law outlaw, outlaw, or outlawing slavery. Where's our movie about the treaty negotiations? Where's our movie about the Good Friday Agreement, for that matter? Which, again, is one of the landmark moments. The hard work is always done by people who doggedly keep pegging away at the, the detail of how a society is going to be constructed and run. Uh, and that, to me, is a sort of a loss here that we haven't really focused on that as much as we might have. Sorry, I'm just going to turn off my phone. Um, okay, sorry, I'm rabbiting on too much. Ask me another one. You're not, not um, too much at all. Uh, and Mike is the historian here, so you'll excuse the, of, my, of my questions. But it is the kind of lines that you were speaking about there. When I was young, an awful long time ago, History was a thing that we learned in school. There, were, there was a book which we opened a couple of times a week. And after four or five years of that, we closed it. And that was the end of history. We may heard little bits from maybe our family. And um, history now comes from so many different directions at people. Um, there's the films, there's movies, there's docudramas. There's whole channels that are devoted to history. What's the effect of that been on the relationship between history, I suppose, and the public? What do you think there? The dangers involved? I think it's largely beneficial. You know, I, I can't see how any decent exploration of the past can do any harm. I mean, take one thing, for example, Roots, which was the, the huge American TV series uh, looking at the roots of an African-American man who comes to America as a slave and his history is, is, uh, is reconstructed. That led to a worldwide boom in genealogy. Well, Western world boom in genealogy which affected everybody because it hadn't struck people before that you could actually do this, that you could reach into the past through your own relatives. And, you know, it was a large part of the work we had in the National Archives, people coming in uh, wanting to know about their, their ancestors. And it was always fascinating to me that Americans would come and say that they knew that in the past they had owned half of Tipperary and it had been taken away from them by the terrible British of the 17th century. Um, and here they went out to find out the details of their patrimony. And, around. and I would then say, well, I wonder when your people left, 1847, usually. I'd always say, they're probably the most successful people ever alive in your entire family, you guys now. So if I were you, I'd go back to the States and enjoy it and stop dreaming about uh, owning half of Tipperary. It's very likely you didn't. And even if you did, there's not going to be any great evidence of it. 
because we blew up all the records in 1922. <laughs> Sorry. But the Australians were wonderful because they'd come in and say that, you know, they could, their ancestor had been transported for stealing a sheep. And that was a badge of honour. It was an entirely different version of a past. They weren't aiming at aristocracy. They got their version of aristocracy from being mistreated by a bad administration that transported people for trying to feed themselves when they were hungry. So different foundation myths and all of that. But Roots did us all a favor, you know, it did actually, and I suppose, who do you think you are, programs like that now, that use celebrities to, to highlight how the past operated, are also um, useful. But, um, and we're still getting excellent books. I mean, in the end, it's the hardcore, serious research, looking at the archival documents, dealing with them, analyzing them, analyzing the ideas that, that pervaded the past, understanding and letting people know that the past is different to the present, which is one of the hardest ideas for people to get their minds around. It's so important to understand that, not to try and see things in the light of our uh, allegedly liberal and wonderful view of the world today. It doesn't work like that. So, I mean, the more the better, Joe, as far as I'm concerned, I think we can't have enough of it. Uh, if it's bad history, however, it has to be challenged in somebody. Has I guess that was my question, is that taking the, hand, the history out of the hands of the historians, in a sense, hasn't necessarily been a bad thing. Uh, no, although I would still count on, on, on the, the historians to be the, the bottom yeah. line. They're the people who can tell whether this is true or not. Uh, is this analysis good? If, you know, somebody is making a old story of a thesis of position on something, how do you know what you know? That, that idea of how do you know what you know is now more important than ever. Uh, the, 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 the absolute explosion of fake news and of rubbish and conspiracy theories on the internet in particular, and all kinds of ways, really requires training in validating information. And a training in history gives you that. It lets you understand there are going to be a number of different points of view on a particular subject, but there will also be basic facts that are incontrovertible, that are simply true. That's that. Uh, a bunch of people did invade the Capitol on the 6th of January. That happened. We saw it on TV. Um, it is denied by certain people. A lot of the conspiracy theories around 9-11 were really dismaying, um, all of that. So history does, it's, it's a practically useful discipline in terms of helping people to evaluate information that's coming their way. Otherwise, they're not going to. Great, thanks. And just Thank one you. thing, Katrina, just very quickly on that point is just that issue of kind of records in the archive, and you, you talked there about things like the witness statements, which are, are fascinating, but a product of their time, clearly uh, in the pension process, women were left out. And we do have a, a problem with the archives and the official record um, that women and the perspectives of women are kind of left out of history. I mean, how do we address that from 100 years ago? How's that battle fought out? Well, it's, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I think it's a cliche. Uh, if you dig into the records, the women are there. You have mm. to catalogue the records properly to find them, right? And that was what the Women's History Project in the, the 90s was about. Yeah. It was about trying to, to excavate from very opaque catalogues records relating to women. And there is tons of stuff there, tons of it. Um, and the, this is about largely ordinary when you've got stuff about women who were prisoners, women who were engaging in rioting in 1847 because they, they had to feed their children, um, every, the women who had triplets and got money from the president. You got money from the president for having triplets for many years, uh, <laughs> trying to encourage the birth rate to rise so that we could uh, you know, export them for immigration, which is what was going on throughout all those years. But, you know, there's plenty of information in the archives about women. It just has to be found and used properly. Uh, that's the basic thing. And we do have to face the basic fact that most powerful people up until very recently were men. So definitively, if you're going to be looking at cabinet records, government records, all that kind of stuff is going to be largely male. You can't just wish women in there because we'd like them to be there. And I'm a feminist. I mean, I'm a very serious feminist and have been all my life. But I think it's overstated. I think that there's been a lot of good work done on, on uh, women during the revolutionary period. 
and not least Lucy McDermott's Fantastic at Home and the Revolution, which is a really wonderful book, and very clever, an interesting book about women at the time. Um, but you can't wish women into positions of leadership if they weren't there. The 1916 Rising was organized by men. They were the leadership, right? Lots of women played significant roles. We know much more about them, luckily now, than we did then. But for a while, it was Constance Markovich and Maud Gaunt. Why rich women? And the sort of deference to that has made me slightly nauseous for a long time. It's fantastic that Kathleen Clark's account of the two of them in Holloway Prison is now getting a bit of an outing, where they, they spent their time talking about who was more important than the other, who was invited to parties at the Vice <laughs> the Lodge, and who was going to get the fur coat when it came in the door. You know. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I find left-wing women adoring Countess Markovich and Maud Gaunt to be a little bit scary. There are plenty of other obvious uh, answers to that. Um, but, you know, Margaret Ward wrote on Management Revolutionaries in 1985. Sure, yeah. you know, there's been a lot of work going on. It's kind of insulting to the women historians who have been doing all this work over the years to say mm -hmm. they've been written out of history. Nah. Uh, and uh, the archival work is hugely important. And that is, I, I would hope that that project gets another outing at some stage because it wasn't it finished. It needs one. We did create a database which has vanished into midair. National Archives, my old alma mater, was supposed to be taken care of it, and it's gone off their website. I must make inquiries, as they say. But it was very useful in terms of pinpointing the places where you're going to find information about women, where you might not think of looking. Um, so it's an ongoing project, but there's a bit too much of the poor mouth about it. There's plenty of work to be done. Get out there and do the work. I mean, there's loads of stuff, loads of records to look at, uh, plenty of clever ways of, of interpreting what we know that perhaps hasn't happened as much as we should. And loads yeah. of questions coming in here, Kath, Katrina, actually, and uh, one from our colleague Jim Smith here. Can you talk, Katrina, about the importance of securing, he says, preserving and affording appropriate access to archives, that's personal records and administrative files, both held by various church organizations related to the provision of care-related services to the vulnerable in Irish society, services as Jim points out, invariably paid for and regulated by the state. Should such material be considered private archival material? Well, I've been saying for many years now that the Catholic Church was a shadow state in this country. Uh, they ran health, education and institutional care through industrial schools, magdalen laundries and mother and baby homes. And we're now still reeling from the publication of the mother and baby homes report which seems to have decided that survivor's testimony is not all that important. It was a shocking kick in the teeth for the 600 plus people who came in to talk to them about their own experiences. Um, really shameful. Um, yes, the records of the religious congregations who ran what were effectively public services in this country should be made public records. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any politician who has the, the, the appetite or the guts to take that on and ask for it. One way that I've suggested in the past is since they are required to pay uh, restitution for the horrors that were inflicted on people in industrial schools, mountain laundries and mother and baby homes, and they have not paid anything like what they should have paid for, say, the, the industrial schools redress scheme, could this be made part of the redress scheme? Can you give us your records? They matter hugely to people who survived those places, but they are also an integral part of the social history of 19th and 20th century Ireland. We don't get to understand this country unless we get the records, particularly of the Catholic Church, because they were tied into so many things. Um, Jacinta Pronti, who I'm a great admirer of, wrote a marvelous congregational history of the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity of Refuge, who ran two industrial schools and two of the biggest Magdalen laundries in Dublin, High Park and Sean McDermott Street. And the records, read through her very long book on the whole thing, our absolute treasure trove. I mean, all kinds of stuff. French nuns coming to Ireland in the 1840s, mm. fighting with the archbishop, setting up their different organizations, fundraising, uh, attracting young women from Irish families to join their order. The whole business of Irish families and their, their, their interconnection with the church through, for example, um, having a nun or a priest in your family, I mean, I had a relative who was a Carmelite nun. It was a delightful woman. Her favorite pastime was watching Formula One racing on the television. Who would have thought it? Um, but, you know, 
unless we have those records, we do not know. And that's a separate issue, if you like, from the absolute right of people who went through these, these terrible places to have information about what happened to them and about their identities, which has been kept for them far too long. Now, hopefully, as a result of the fallout from the Mother and Baby Home Report, they will get access to that information through the new adoption and tracing bill. But we've been there before. And the idea that you can't get your birth certificate in the 21st oh. century, heartbreaking. So yeah, I can, Jim is, uh, has asked the right question as he always does. And that is my view on the matter. I have made no secret of it. Uh, I can't see any ministers beating down the path to my door to see if we can organize some way to do it. But we have to keep banging the drum. Yeah. And do you think, I mean, you've talked elsewhere, Katrina, about the idea that almost the creation of a national repository of institutional records is, is one way of approaching all the different issues of this. I mean, also that's clearly a critical idea in building up the archival history of the orders that their role, as you say, kind of running a host of kind of institutions that their fingers are very deep. What do you think need to be done to make that happen? Well, there's interesting discussion at the moment about using the, the, the old Sean McDermott Street uh, laundry and convent are still there. The laundry is gone, but the convent is still there. And New Productions, one of my favourite theatre companies, did an astonishing event there in 2011 where, you know, one, three members of an audience at a time came in and they took you through the experience of being in, working in the laundry there and, and what happened. Uh, and there's talk of that there was a, a protest, a very serious protest against selling that site to a Japanese hotel who wanted to buy it. It's now been accepted that it should be a memorial site. But part of that is to make an archival uh, repository there too. Now, it's not clear yet how that might work out. Uh, it may become a, a place where, where survivors can leave testimonies that they would like to be in the open rather than locked away for many years. Um, it may, if anyone ever does get it together, or if the church itself has a change of heart on this matter, be a place where those institutional records can be lodged. But at any rate, some of the, 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 the state records, of which there are many, uh, relating to industrial schools and mother and baby homes, could be copied, digitized, and put in there into a reading room where people can look at these things as a coherent set of records. So there are endless possibilities. It's, it's a very good choice as a place to do it because of its, uh, its obvious emotional connection with, with women in the past. Right. Uh, a series of specific questions here, uh, Katrina, about um, the Land Commission records. Isabella Courtney, I see, uh, Raymond Turl and uh, Owen O'Sullivan. Admiring your work, of course, uh, Owen, and just wondering what your thoughts are about the costs and complexities of opening up the land commission records might might be, and um, yeah, basically. basically, they should be open. It's against the law to have them shot. It's ridiculous. I mean, ugh. the the land commission had its own special repository, a concrete special built repository at the back of what is now the Marion Hotel. The land commission was in those buildings on Marion Street that are now gorgeous places for afternoon tea and a glass of champagne if you're interested. Um, and when that was sold, the building was sold to whoever built that hotel, uh, there was panic because they were going to pull down the beautiful concrete repository at the back and destroy all the records. So we in the National Archives had to step in and mount a, a fire brigade operation to rescue the records, stick them into our warehouse at the back of Bishop Street on very ramshackle shelving. But I mean, I had a wonderful archivist who I must name called Una Wark from the north of Ireland, who took on that project and did a fantastic job of making sure everything was where it should be. But this is another treasure trove, another major gap that we're missing. What was the biggest issue all along? Land. And we are not able to evaluate that. We have to remember while we're all going on about 1916 and the War of Independence and the Civil War, behind everyone's back during that time, from the, the establishment of the Land Commission in 1891, in 1922, 75% of the land of Ireland was transferred from landlord to tenant. If that isn't a revolution, tell me what is. Again, a conservative revolution. It created a small holding Catholic peasant society that feeds directly into the Catholic Church's desire for sexual probity and respectability and all of those things. So that, that's another story. 
But all of those records are there, including the deeds from the original estates that were transferred back to tenants later on, some of which go back to the 15th century, which is, you know, crucial in terms of filling gaps left by what was destroyed in the four courts in 1922. So, yeah, I mean, Terry Dooley, for example, Professor Terry Dooley has been fighting about this for years, trying desperately to get them to open up the stuff, and they won't. And actually, what somebody needs to do is go to court about it and just say, right, if you won't open them up voluntarily, you are breaking the law. Under the National Archives Act, these records should be in the public domain and should be there for everyone to see. There's nothing in any way going to harm anyone in, in terms of sensitivity of these records are released. There's no threat to national security. It's the story of the transfer of land from landlord to tenant. You know, how bad can that be? Um, and part of it is just profound laziness and part of it is also lack of space in the National Archives. But not, none of these things is insurmountable if somebody wants to do it. I mean, I failed and I'm ashamed of myself. I should have fought much harder, but I did fight pretty hard and didn't get anywhere. Um, so anybody who feels like starting a campaign, you can sign me up. I'm on for it. And on that kind of basis, uh, Donna Morgan asked a question. Do you think that the government gives enough importance to the protection and development of our archives? The National Archives is hardly fit for purpose in the modern island. Would you agree that we need a, a mate to purpose building and accompanying funding to achieve this? That's my friend, Donna Morgan, trying to catch me out. It won't work, Donna. I know what you're up to. Um, yeah, of course, it's underfunded and under-resourced and always has been, basically. Um, the, the Public Records Office had more staff before 1922 than it has ever had since. Uh, compared to countries of similar size, like Scotland or Denmark, we have something like a, a third or a quarter of the staffing that they have. Um, it's not taken seriously. It's, that is the truth. And it needs to be fought for. And it needs historians to fight much harder for it than they do. Historians can often be very content to get the bit they want, and that's cool. Now I'm done. But there needs to be a concerted effort. You know, people like Terry Dooley have really fought very hard to get access to records that are important. There needs to be more of a concerted effort to actually get... Um, uh, to get the, the, the resources that are needed to do that. I mean, the, the big Holocaust that's going to happen now is electronic records. No one's doing much about that. Uh, we have stuff going back now to the 1970s, some of which is probably irretrievably lost. And historians in 50 years' time are going to look back and say, my God, there's a black hole in our record of what was going on in the Irish state during that time. Um, but it, to, as in my experience, it's not really taken seriously. You have to fight for every damn thing you get. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll get money, as I did, for something like the Census Project, which, was, uh, which was, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was an awful lot for us. And it did change a lot of things in terms of how people saw digitization and all of that. But no, John is right. I mean, they're not paying enough attention. It's not fit for purpose. There isn't enough space. They are getting a new building built on the... Um, site of Bishop Street. The old warehouse is going to be pulled down and a new custom-built storage facility put up. But Bishop Street isn't ideal either, you know, as, as a, it doesn't have a lecture theatre, doesn't have an exhibition space. None of those things were ever there. Um, it was a stopgap measure in itself when we got it in the early 90s and became the de facto National Archives. So yeah, I mean, I'm done. I'm I'm tired. I'm retired now. I'm not going to have to do this anymore. But I would certainly support any anybody who tries to because it needs to be done. We need to think properly about our archives and um, resources problem. And I'd say that that uh, speaks to a question that I came in here from Alicia, and she wonders how you feel about records activism and active and and advocacy in the Irish archiving profession today. I suspect your answer is that the activism isn't active enough and the advocacy needs to be even a bit more advocative, if I can make up a, an adjective there. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it depends on what you mean. Obviously, I think most archivists would be activists to a degree anyway, about supporting their own repositories making sure that everything is done properly there and getting trying to find funding and so on for it. Many archivists work really, really hard and keep the show on the road against terrible laws, particularly local authority archivists who, where there's often one person or two people 
and they're kind of heroic. They really keep the show on the road. And it's difficult because you're competing for scarce resources from the county council, uh, which has other claims on its money, right. as uh, always happens. But I think we could all as a profession be more activist about the people in the archives. I think we need to be more to the fore about, for example, things like the, the attempt to lock up the records of the, the first to destroy the records of the Ryan Commission into industrial schools and second uh, to lock them up for a very long time with, the, with a, a new piece of legislation that was completely unnecessary, that mm -hmm. nobody needed. Um, again, th there's, there's a sort of horror and fear of these stories of our past which reflect terribly badly on the state and the church. But I would see my job as an archivist not to be uh, helping the church and the state to keep all this quiet or to lock the stuff away. Uh, our job as archivists should be to consult the survivors and find out what they want to happen to their records. And that doesn't happen. And I wish there was more interest in survivors from my colleagues. Some are very interested, but not that many. And these are crucial questions for our society, not just for archives, but they are also crucial questions for archives because they're about access, about the, the big principle of our archival access to records that are more than a certain, there for more than a certain period of time. Um, we need a lot more activism on that. Thanks, thanks. And in, the, in that gap, in a way, Katrina, of, of people not being able to access those institution records, their own personal records a lot of the time. And obviously one thing, I mean, you touched on it earlier, but I mean, one thing you've been very uh, brilliant at kind of advocating and pushing forward is kind of theatre and your work with kind of a new productions, uh, the site-specific uh, and historic work, Living the Lockout, Pals, the Irish at Gallipoli, and so on. I mean, obviously, of what, first of all, why were you so keen to push those forward? But do they then serve that function in a way of kind of getting the stories out there, even if they're not getting the archives out, the archives out there? Yes, they do. Uh, they, they've worked really well. I mean, I've done a lot of work with the new as an archivist. Mm -hmm. Uh, where they, they would do background research on, on what they're wanting to do. I mean, Paz was a wonderful experience. A, a large joy is a great friend of mine. He's now the, he was the, the curator of military history in the National Museum in Collins Barracks. Uh, and he's now the heritage officer for, for the Port of Dublin, which is a fantastic job to have and all kinds of interesting things can happen there. They have brilliant archives going back to the 17th century. But Laura was bored. We were at some event or other in 2014. It must have been the launch of one of the things to do with the decades. And we went off to the Flowing Tide to have a jar afterwards. And he was looking miserable. And I said, what's wrong with you? And he said, here we are in 2014 and we have nothing ready on World War I. We're going to have a small exhibition that won't be great. And there's no real attempt. I mean, other countries are spending millions on exhibitions and drama and all the rest of it. So I said, well, forget about 2014 and think about 2015. What was going on in 2015 in Ireland related to our World War I? I didn't know. And a light bulb went on over his head and he said, pals. And I said, what, what are pals? Young men who joined, if they were, in this case, members of the, the same rugby team mm. to go to fight in World War I. And as it turned out, magically, the National Museum in Collins Barracks had been the place where these boys had trained before they went, the rugby players. And as it turned out, even more magically, the actual dormitories in which they slept at the time were actually vacant when we wanted to do this. So there was massive sympathetic magic around this whole process. And we, they turned the, the story of five individuals into this incredible thing that in an hour you were taken from them as rugby players going off full of hope to war into the most vicious stuff that happened in Gallipoli when they got there. And the Gallipoli story had been sort of forgotten about. So, I mean, a lot of people came to it and so many people cried their eyes out at that, uh, at that show. I mean, we brought it back twice because the public demand was gigantic. Um, it was a marvelous experience and it, it taught me a lot about the power of drama to get public history across. And they ran a lot of educational stuff along with it on a website. They did a lot of classes with school children about World War I. All of that stuff can, can, can get in with people in a way that the straightforward stuff might not. 
or an exhibition might be, although there have been wonderful exhibitions over the last few years in all of our cultural institutions, but this is a more direct and visceral way of connecting people into a past that they might find mysterious or baffling. They come out knowing much more, exponentially more than they did. Questions coming in here, continuing, Katrina, and I'm going to attempt to um, have two of them here, from Catherine Shannon and from Pierce McHenry, and both referring to oral history. Catherine wonders how should oral history be used to supplement and expand the traditional archival approach, especially, she's thinking, in the area of women's history and the recent experience of Northern Ireland women. Uh, the, the benefits and drawbacks of that. And Pierce wondering something similar, he says, do you see a place for history from below? in the specific form of oral archives. He's thinking especially of the break, which has occurred sometime in the late 20th century, whereby history, culture, and memory are no longer transmitted, of course, orally as they once were. To those questions. Yeah, I mean, oral history is, is wonderful. We now have an oral history network of Ireland that has laid out proper protocols and ethical standards for how to conduct such interviews. Uh, I'm involved in a project with uh, Grange Gorman now the Techn Technological University of Dublin, where there are vast numbers of people who worked in Grange Gorman when it was a mental institution. And Mary Muldowney, who's one of the great pioneers of oral history here, is conducting an oral history project with a lot of those people. And again, she it is hedged around with all of the safeguards that you need to have in place. Uh, everything is done properly. Endless room for that. I mean, I live in the North Inner City. We had what we called a folklore project for a long time in the 70s and 80s, where we interviewed local people about their, their memories of their past, about employment, about relationships, about all sorts of stuff. We tried again, but we didn't have an oral history network then to, to advise us, but we tried to do it as carefully and respectfully as we could. And all of that stuff is now in the Labour History Museum, unfortunately, uncatalogued, so it can't be seen, but at least it's safe. So yes, absolutely history from below. We need to hear those voices. Um, and I, in a way, I'm, I'm not going to mention Boston College because it was... Don't, don't obvious. use the word. Don't. It's not a thing you want to be hearing about, either you, I'm sure. But it did create a bit of a, a setback for the, the um, history of the conflict in Northern Ireland. Um, we have to remember the Bureau of Military History is an oral history. That's what it is. An oral history from the 1940s and 50s conducted very stringently and carefully and um, very useful from that point of view because what, what do you get in oral history that you don't get in official sources? You get voice, you get people's own voices, that wonderful resonance that you get from the voice of a human being telling something their own words. Which again brings me back to you know what could have been one of the great oral histories uh, produced by a commission of inquiry, which is the, the, the testimony given by survivors who went to the confidential committee of the Mother and Baby Home Inquiry, which have the, the tapes of which have been destroyed by the commission, uh, but the backup tapes exist. And there's been such an outcry about the attempt to destroy those that they are now safe, one hopes. And there'll be a long and proper discussion about what should happen to those tapes. And the survivors have to be central to that discussion in terms of what they want to happen to that material. But that is a fantastic cohort of testimony that uh, we, we now hopefully have into the future. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and then just generally, I mean, we're reaching the end of the, the time, Katrina. Just in terms of you're just somebody who's so kind of active and fascinated by so many things. What is it kind of excite you in terms of literature, history, kind of in, in a way, what you read, what, what, when you sit down and think, right, I've got some headspace and some time, what do you dip I into? I spend far too much time reading the Atlantic Monthly, the New York Times and the Washington Post. I'm afraid I'm a freak about American politics. Well, who wouldn't be after the last four years, you know? At least we don't have the terrible buzzing noise going on in our heads that we had to listen to for four years. Joe Biden is a masterpiece of peace and quiet and pretty good policies, I have to say, uh, compared to the, the monstrous behavior of his lordship. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I love literature. Uh, I, I can't remember the last novel I read. I tend to read history and politics most of the time now. Um, but I suppose 
you know, I, I, I intend to read Shuggy Bane, which is the book that won the Booker Prize last year. Uh, I, it comes really highly recommended. I love the idea of uh, uh, a Scottish voice. Uh, I was always very fond of Scottish literature. Um, so I'll get to that at some point. But I'm ashamed of myself. I mean, you know, just to finish up on, on something interesting. When I was 16, my father gave me Tolstoy's War and Peace as a Christmas mm -hmm. present. And I read it over three days at Christmas. I couldn't put it down. And of course, it is a wonderful novel. And, you know, Natasha and Andre and all the rest of it is fantastic. But a good third of War and Peace is Tolstoy's musings on history, uh, theories of history, his understanding of history, his plea for history not to be about kings and queens, but to be about ordinary people. And I never forgot it. And in a way, that's what drove me into doing history in college. That's, I love the ideology of history, I suppose, I mean to say. And uh, that gave me that sense that this is, this is a way of thinking that is valuable and important and various, and that, that I really wanted to get into that. And I suppose it's informed everything I've done. So I suppose you could say that all the stuff I've done came from reading a major Russian novel when I was 16 years old, and it's never left. Well, that's a really wonderful note to uh, end on, Katrina. There are lots of other questions out here that I'm afraid we're not going to go, go get, get to. Thanks very much to everybody who has sent in those questions. I'm glad we covered one or two of them there. And um, I'm going to just, uh, I think we just speak for a second about who we have coming up next week. Do you have a slide or anything there, Mike? Because I'm kind of excited about next year's, uh, next week's speaker. And it is, of course, uh, as you see there, Eve Watson. Eve is a psychotherapist. Uh, she works in Dublin here. She's a clinical supervisor and she's an academic. She's involved in teaching, that is, and training in psychoanalysis and in teacher education. Uh, she writes uh, multiply on sexuality studies, on critical psychology, on poetics, on film, and on critical theory. And on top of that, she's the editor of a Lacanian journal called Lacune. So she's an awful lot of things to tell us. And indeed, the title next week is Can You Psychoanalyze the Irish? So if you're wondering uh, about that and you want to hear the answer, come along to us next week at the same time. That's to say 4.30 EST over in the States and 9.30 over here in Ireland. And I think we're in for a, a delight. And we had a delight tonight. Uh, Mike, do you want to say goodbye? Is? Katrina, thank you very much. That's absolutely fantastic. And uh, see you soon anyway, as absolutely. well. But anyway, Thank you both for having me and thanks to the audience for paying attention. And I must find a way to get into your future discussions because it's, uh, it's obviously... Absolutely. Thanks, Bye Katrina. Everyone, and thank you so much for having me. And just before everybody goes, I'll, I'll remind you all, and remind Katrina herself indeed, that you can see this and you can see all of the other uh, uh, weekly Irish influence pieces on our YouTube um, uh, channel. And if you simply put in the Irish influence, you'll find it on YouTube. They're all archived there. And on top of that, not just the pieces themselves, but little 15 minute highlights of them there. So there you are. You can look at Katrina a second or even a third time round if it pleases you. And of course it would. Take care. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks Katrina. Take care. Thank you.